So my question was about the point of view that the uh, film adopted, that you were going to tell these uh, anthropologist stories in parallel. Can you talk about when you decided to adopt that narrative stance with the film? Hmm. Um, well, we were following uh, Susie and Katie. Uh, that's how we first started. And then we noticed this sort of like, I guess, you know, Katie had her foot in both worlds, in the world of an indigenous person whose community was being affected by climate change, and also through her mother, this world of science. And we thought, oh, okay, here's this kind of great narrative, a great way to tell the story. But then as we sort of went to all these different locations, we realized that it was like something that was being passed on from uh, Susie to Katie. Uh, you know, this kind of way of, way of observing the world. Uh, you know, not only this like kind of scientific knowledge, but the, the, the way of viewing people and observing behavior. And the more we sort of researched, we found out that's a common phenomenon among anthropologists. Uh, and we did, you know, a little more research, and there's this whole kind of parallel story about Margaret Mead. Um, and we thought it would be a great way to sort of kind of bring the narrative of Susie and Katie all together. And so the film storytelling uh, does it in two sort of different types of styles. Like when you're do dealing with a lot of archival material for Margaret Mead's story and then for following Susie and Katie, it's more verite. Can you talk about balancing the two? So that was a, a, real, tr a real trick of, of the documentary. Was not was not so much the archive going back and forth between archival and verite. I mean, that that's that's okay. That, that works easy enough. Um, but I think it was showing a verite story where you're following these two characters on the road, um, and then having this sort of separate uh, narrator in in the form of Mary Catherine Bateson, who's not a part of the action, but commenting throughout in this in this uh, in this interview. So that was the real challenge for us, how, how, was, how, how to make that work. Um, and, and the answer is it just took a lot of time. You know, there's too much of Bates and you pull back, and there's too much of the, the verite. Without her, you, you include her back in. So that was, that was essentially how I was saying. I didn't really ask, answer your question. No, I didn't. The songs in there, there's not only the songs in the movie, but also every time you heard a voice, a vocal in the movie, uh, it was a, a famed singer songwriter, Dar Williams, um, who is here. Where's Dar? <laughs> she is also my neighbor. Um, we are very happy to have her on the soundtrack. Um, and then this is a, you want one more, I promise. Um, but you'll love this. So in the, in the final footage that you see, you see this, this archival footage uh, with the three generations of the Mead family. So you see Margaret Mead, the grandmother, Mary Catherine Bateson, um, the, the daughter, and then Margaret Mead's granddaughter, a little one, named Savon. And Savon is here. Savon, where are you? There you go. Stand up and take a bite. You're in the movie. You're a star. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you. My pleasure. Since we're in the audience, let's open up to the audience. Uh, any questions out there? So the scene where they're meeting with the president and the two women break into a song, what was that about? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was, it was, I'm going to give this to Susie in a second, but it, it was a very long session with the president, maybe four hours or so, and it wasn't quite clear what we were supposed to do. So we all made the best of it. And Susie had to give a speech. She was a little nervous about it. But she did a good job. Uh, as soon as the speech was over, they started doing you know, almost like Broadway show stuff. And that was just one song you saw. There were songs. There were dances. There was mocking. There was embarrassment. Uh, I think that's how president, the president rolls. rolls. Right. So, but Susie, your take on that. Well, I, I also think that, for example, the song, We Are One Great Big Family, is that what it was? I think that they knew a few songs in English, and they knew that that was our main language, and so they wanted to give what they knew to us. 
So, I mean, it appeared like, you know, we were being put down or something, but I, I didn't take it that way. I felt like they were sharing with us what they knew. And it was long and drawn out because they do it that way. I mean, there's like, it's long and drawn out, and um, they like to, to hang out together. And the whole process, you didn't really see the eating process. The elders ate first, and that was long, and everybody else was sort of waiting. So, you know, of course, we didn't want to really give you the full effect of that long, drawn out process because you probably leave, right? <laughs> but it was. So. Yes, right here. Uh, I was wondering how the balance was between giving us this beautiful, intimate, rich mother-daughter relationship versus the social issue of the day, climate change. You made it look so seamless, but was it difficult at all even back and forth that making that decision how to narrate it? Question about telling the beautiful mother-daughter story between balancing that with the climate change issue story. Right. First of all, thank you. Um, it, it, it just took forever. So that's really the answer. Uh, there was a lot of uh, struggling to like sort of get the story right and to weave these stories together. Um, and, you know, as we kept on going through, we found the themes that kept on matching, whether it's like kind of the, the notion of like Mother Earth let's say, and us kind of taking from Mother Earth kind of thing, or, um, you know, the, the, uh, this knowledge being passed on between generations, which I spoke about before, or how, you know, how the solving the problem, the problem of climate change is up to the next generation. All these things kept on weaving in and out, and, you know, um, and it was, it was a challenge to make it, you know, to keep uh, the Mead story in and to pull back when we needed to and to let the story of Susie and Katie go, because sometimes it was, uh, you know, so Katie, Katie and Katie's a very interesting character, but we didn't want to make it too much of like, you know, a, a family drama, per se. Um, but those were sometimes the most fun moments, you know, so it's just like a, a, a constant balance. So I wanted to say, um, when I was approached, when these guys approached me in 2009, I was not interested. I did not want to be followed around, and I wanted to do my research. And then uh, I thought about it a little bit, and this is a pretty, uh, this is like the biggest thing that human humans have faced. And if, in fact, we can get this message out to more people in a way that they'll get it, and we might be preaching to the converted in this theater, but the idea of this film is to bring it home to people before it has to come here to bring it home to us because that's going to be way too late. So even though it took six years to, lay, to, to make, and, and, and I did agree to do it for this specific purpose. Um, and my reference to it being the next generation who's going to turn it around has to do with all of the comments I make about innovation and creativity because that's what generations do. That's the adaptive process. Uh, young people come in and they're not yet quite set in their ways. And we've got too many people who are set in their ways making the decisions right now. We need young people who have that creative innovation. We need to nurture that, which our school system doesn't necessarily do, but that's another story. We need to nurture that creative, innovative spirit, and we need to push it forward with all our might. So your vote counts. <laughs> and everything else. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much.